there was no baseball game today, but we do have a Colorado Rocky series on deck. We have a lot of prospect talk. There was some prospect movement. We're going to get into all of that. And we're just going to deep dive the minors. You're going to find out like using some advanced stats that you don't typically hear. Who are some guys to watch in the minors? Why players are moving around? And of course, why I think the Guardians are going to beat the Rockies at least two out of three. And, you know, continue to stay very tight for that third wild card spot. You are Locked On Guardians. Your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So I want to thank everyone for making Lockdown Guardians their first listen today and every day, wherever it is that you get podcasts. I also want to take a second to introduce myself. My name is Jeff Ellis. I'm the host of Lockdown Guardians for all 700 plus episodes of the show. Before that, I was the host of, was it the host of? I mean, I I ran the website, uh, Scouting Baseball for Scout and 24-7, where I worked on uh, prospects and the draft. The draft was my primary primary focus. Uh, Before that, I wrote at Indians Baseball, Indians Prospect Insider. Uh, such sterling pieces as diamonds and single A, where I wrote about uh, you know Alexander Perez before he got hurt, or uh, Connor Grams after he came over in the Raphael Betancourt trade, I believe. Uh, those come to mind uh, in terms of you know not so much success back in the dark days of the minor leagues, which are not at all the case anymore. Uh, you know, I was just kind of looking over at. I mean, there's so many things we're going to get into, and they tell us not to do that. But before I get into that, uh, I want to thank. Blue Nile for being the title sponsor of today's show. Uh, So let's start with the minors. I I have the Rockies put up in front of me, but let's forget it. Today, uh, so let's talk about some minor league awards. The International League AAA Baseball Player of the Week was Will Brennan, who went 15 for 21 over his last five games. That's right, 15 for 21 with two doubles and five RBIs. I'm going to say that again. He got, remember when we talked about earlier in the year when he was hitting 400 in double A and how I talked about, you know, he was a fascinating guy, Kansas State. Should I just, I feel like I should probably pause it, but, you know, I'll talk extemporaneously and pull up. Uh, You know, he's a two way guy. He was a lefty pitcher in college. Trying to remember if he was a starter as well. Um, Will they, will baseball reference throw his pitching data in here? Yeah. Uh, So at Kansas State, he was a starter his uh, in 2019, his final season, but he was mostly a reliever. But when you look at Kansas State, that's not a... Listen, the Big 12 is definitely a haves and have-nots when it comes to uh, baseball, just in general. Uh, let's... I'm going to pause this so I can tell you, you know, the, the best players in Kansas State history. So here's where it gets fun with this list. I actually had a hard time finding it. I went to Baseball Cube and I wasn't pulling up. So when you're looking at the Kansas State players, they've only had 12 big leaguers, guys who've actually played a game in the big leagues. 13 made it to the majors, but only 13 played. Andy Rapolgo uh, didn't play in any games. Uh, The Guardians actually have two guys on this list, uh, including maybe the most successful, Ted Power. Does anyone else remember him at the very end of his career in like the 80s with the the Guardians slash Indians? And then uh, Craig, uh, not Craig, Evan Marshall, who... uh, Felt like I was complaining about him on this podcast, but I don't think I was hosting it in 2018. I was trying to remember when this thing started. I think it started in 2019, so I don't think I started in 2018, but maybe it was just me complaining in press boxes about the fact that why were they running Evan Marshall out, who's still pitching. Uh, the other names, uh, Bob Randall played in the most games, and it was a five-year career uh, with a career 621 OPS, all with Minnesota. And then you have Eldon Ocker, who had the most wins, who played in the 30s and 40s. And then the the really the only other name that I knew on this list was Craig Wilson. And I was kind of surprised it was such a short career for him. Only like two and a half years in the big leagues. Uh, only 139 games, honestly, because I, I remember Craig Wilson baseball cards. Like, it felt like he had played longer than that. So, yeah, Will Brennan has a chance to be the greatest player in the you know, Kansas State University history. It's not a big program, but, man, is he excelling. He's just, what can't he do right now? Uh, I mean, yes, obviously, it's not like he is a power hitter or anything like that, but he has been highly productive. If I jump over here and talk about, like, highest runs created plus 
in the organization. He currently has the fourth this year, uh, and he's only a spot behind the two guys tied for second. We'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's got a 333 average, 403 on base, 493 slugging, an 896 OPS, a 145 runs creative plus. It's good. Uh, everything across the board. Now his bat pip is a 366, but if you listen to the show, you should know that bat pip in the minors is more a positive sign of contact than anything else. And you got 11, nearly 11% walk rate with a nearly 13% strikeout rate. Very positive signs. And then, listen, I know I get some feedback, Andrew, or Andrew, Aaron, I hope you're doing well when I bash uh, Virginia. But the new bash is in Virginia. You know, that's, what was the old meme? Like, that's, I don't know. You know, bash in Virginia was about 15 minutes ago. Now it's bash in Florida. Jack Leftwich, Carolina League Pitcher of the Week. Uh, Saturday start, six innings, one hit, struck out eight, a 2.13 ERA on the year. Uh, left, which was a potential, potential day one pick out of high school who the guardians got for like basically slot in the sixth round. Uh, cause he didn't develop at all at Florida. Hey, Tommy Mace didn't develop at all at Florida. You might see, uh, a pattern why they took three Florida arms a year ago. And, you know, Will Brennan coming from Kansas State. Listen, the, the Guardians front office are a bunch of savages, uh, and they have no problems putting you on blast if you are not developing well. They will sit there, and if you are the Reds or the Padres, they're going to target your pitching, thinking that they can get more out of guys that you didn't get enough out of. Uh, if you are a college program not doing as well as you should, they're going to go and target you repeatedly in the draft. They're just... Are kind of jerks, uh, but I am all for it. Uh, speaking of like college programs, Tennessee getting knocked off. Like people are calling it like the greatest. I listen. Tennessee was a very good program. They're gonna have a lot of high picks, but it's not like that is even the greatest program I've seen in my lifetime. It's not like it was the best. You know, one through nine talent it was a very good program. Was it historically good? No, but I also want to take a moment and say like, man, how long? Speaking of programs, I bash for college baseball. Remember how bad Lee I bashed Notre Dame? How, like, literally you wanted to target the Notre Dame program because they were not developing anyone at all, and then they hadn't even made it to, like, this stage of the College World Series in 20-plus years? Why did it take them so long to change coaching staffs? It's kind of ridiculous, but, hey, one change and things go. Well, yeah, you can... Uh, let's put it this way. I would not be surprised, especially with his injury, if Hunter Barco becomes a day-two target. Florida pitcher... Didn't develop as expected. Might have heard that story, you know, a bunch last year. And due to his injury, I don't know what his asking price can be. He was already kind of a fringe day one player to begin with. So, uh, and if you are someone like Hunter Barco, you want to go to Cleveland anyways. You're not going to price yourself out of maybe the the perfect place for you. So just keep that in mind. Let's, how are we doing on time? Um, so segment one was just like some... Uh, surface minor league chatter awards we need let's get into the movement and then we'll talk about the movement in segment two and then segment three we'll do our preview of the rock rockies the rockers no the, the colorado rockies versus the guardians so nick enright and andrew oh, i listened i literally listened to a, a clip uh i'm gonna pause so i can go re-listen to the clip because i lost it in in between my preparation andrew miziazic uh, or miz as they called him uh, and Nick Enright were both promoted. Mizzy Ozick is a lefty. You know, it's important to note that. Uh, Enright is a righty. Eli Lingos and uh, Thomas Ponticelli. Nacho wants to, my co-host wants to jump in for this bit. Um, he's a big fan of Andrew Mizzy Ozick, uh, so he couldn't be off screen for this. But uh, Ponticelli and Lingos got demoted. Uh, Lenny Torres was activated, and then Milan Tolentino got the bump up to Lake County. Uh, who's currently one of those players tied for second in terms of runs created plus. So we'll get into all of this. Like I saw people being like, why is Ponte, uh, Ponticelli demoted when he's got an ERA under two? We'll, we'll talk about that and more on segment two of Locked On Guardians. I've talked about this many times on the show. Don't be a sm schmuck like me. Go to rockauto.com. Take advantage of their savings, of the deals, of everything that is happening and going on over at Rock Auto because you'll save money. That's just the truth of it. That is how this works. I could have saved myself $50 if I had gotten my windshield wipers at Rock Auto, and instead uh, I'm $50 poorer 
because I just went and let them put whatever they had when I got my oil change. I was lazy. You go to Rock Auto, you type your car model in. It's very easy. It's got a little fire emblem to let you know what sells. Well, I mean, I could have saved even more money in that, but I, I would stick with the best seller. That's my personal view. And it's not just for the do-it-yourselfer. Filters and windshield wipers are things anyone can do. Go to rockauto.com today. Save yourself some money. You will. Uh, make sure just to write in the little how to hear about us box, locked on, locked on Guardians, locked on MLB, some form of locked on, so they know that their advertising money was well spent. Go to rockauto.com today and save yourself a nice chunk of change. Listen, I love drafts. Go check out the uh, NBA mock draft show they are putting together on Locked On. They do great work when it comes to these big shows. And, you know, the, we already had our first uh, draft pick trade, at least in, uh, since the trade deadline, I believe, today with uh, Denver and Oklahoma City. So go check it out. I'm sure they will be, it'll be all covered there. Uh, let's see, what else? I had something pop in my head that I'm like, oh, I need to talk about this, and it went away. Oh, um, t- it, Chartable is weird. <laughs> I think I talked about, like, last week, they had us in the 190s, and they listed us in the 120s for this week, but said we dropped 40 spots. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But so just remember to download daily. It helps. Uh, subscribe on the YouTube. Uh, today, you know, yesterday I had a tweet about, and it was kind of funny because, you know, it's just this idea that, and my tweet was incorrect. I said that they're like three and a half back for the wild card. I forgot. It's expanded wild cards. Before Boston won last night, Cleveland was currently leading the wild card race. Uh, they had the final one in place. The top three make it. So they were currently at that time in if you know the playoffs had begun. Now, again, it's super early. In the number of people, like I had someone who reached out. I was like, yeah, and they got the worst owner in sports. I'm like, okay, listen. I have said I look forward to new ownership and new money being invested, but Dan Snyder is still alive. (laughs) Sorry, you can't claim it when Dan Snyder is still alive. I mean, you could make strong arguments that he's not even the worst owner in Cleveland with some of the stuff that has occurred over the past few years. Now, again, I'm not saying ownership is great. I'm not saying ownership is good. That's a pretty bold statement. Um, I did not get, I was surprised I didn't get more people. There were a few who were mad about name change stuff. Uh, it's always interesting how much of a stratified society we are because it's always like anyone who comes at me mad about name change, you can go to their profile and it'll be 50% about who they voted for in the last election. And then 50% about, you know, uh, not even 50, about 25% about baseball and 25% about other angry political stuff. Uh, and then, you know, it's like, I never see someone defending it who leans one way, and I never see anyone who's angry about the name change leading the other way. There's just a, you know, it's a very stark divide, and it just, the battle lines of this country sometimes. Uh, My whole point now is just like, hey, no matter how your battle line falls, this is a fun young team. Get in on it. Uh, And then, I was trying to think of it, and then I had some people complaining, like, none of them are high-end prospects. Well, Jose Ramirez was not never a top 100 guy. Shane Bieber is never a top 100 guy. The Guardians operate their minor leagues kind of like you know the NFL draft. It's more about uh, it's more about the hits than about how high you pick, right? It's you know the data shows through the years of the NFL draft that it's better to have like four second rounders than two firsts, and you'll have a much higher success rate. Well, the Guardians, you know, I. I had to. I was in the minority when that Clevenger deal happened. Like most people, were like why did they trade Clevenger for you know six? They traded a dollar for sixty cents. You know maybe seventy cents. I was like, no, they got six interesting players. All of them interesting. All of them with a chance to help. You go back to that Bauer deal. They got five players. You can even go back to CC Sabathia. That was four. Cliff Lee was. You know, Marson, Donald, Knapp, Carrasco, that was at least four. Uh, yeah, because they, they never want to, you know, when the Clevenger deal happened, people are like, oh, you know, they traded more value to Seattle with Taylor Trammell, and Trammell's playing better now, but, like, nobody would trade what they traded for Austin Nola for what they traded for Clevenger. And we get too focused on prospect rankings and, like, just trust the team and their development and uh, what they're doing here. And it's just ridiculous the number of people who youngest team in baseball for the second year in a row, the most fun team to watch in a very long time. 
young talent is starting to hit in waves. They're contending for the wild card, and people still want to complain. What can you do? So, speaking of complaints, Thomas Ponticelli. I understand Ponticelli, why, you know, former 12th round pick at the University of San Francisco in 2018, so they probably scouted him when they uh, saw Bradley Zimmer. It was, in, it was about the same time as Bradley Zimmer. And a 12th round pick is a valuable pick. That is a player that they target in day two. You know, coming, he worked kind of slowly through the minors. He had a 1.54 ERA in AAA in uh, 23 innings. So there was a lot of like, why did he get demoted? Well, he's got a 5.4 walk per nine and a strikeout per nine of 7.3. That's it. Those are what matter. ERA doesn't matter. Those stats are what matter to this organization. And that's just not enough. Eli Lingos has always been kind of a good organizational soldier. He goes up, he goes down. He's Tanner Tully esque in terms of like, he fills a spot as needed for this team. Arizona State. Arizona State. Could have got myself in trouble. As a lefty, you always want a few lefties in the pen, and that's what he's been for them pretty much from the moment he was drafted. And, you know, his walk per nine at 2.7 was actually strong for him. Last year, he had some struggles with his control. Uh, but last year, only through 20 innings in general in uh, AA. So this year, the he's already, he's already thrown more innings this year than he did last year. And he just doesn't miss bats. He is what he is. But let's talk about the guys that stayed, which is Andrew, let's call him the Miz, a lefty. Again, you can never have too many of those. Uh, He has a strikeout per nine of 13.5, a walk per nine of 2.25, a K percentage of 41%, a FIP, lowest in the minors of of the Cleveland's minors, of 1.71%. If you're curious, number two on that list is Cade Smith, who you might want to pay attention to at 1.72 FIP because his K per nine is 17.85 in 20 innings. They said a 20 inning minimum. Uh, now he is kind of old for high A. By the way, third in FIP, Jack Leftwich, who I talked about on the show today, who only a 13.18 strikeouts per nine, but his walk rate is 1.7. So there's you know a lot of guys to look at, but the Miz here, we talked about Tim Heron. Uh, who got the call up and we talked about you know Anthony Ghost and maybe that should be a warm seat the Miz and Heron are both guys who are rule five eligible and there's going to be some choices to be made and some things to figure it out but I mean he is just excelling and I can say this I threw a few tweets out about him and uh, kind of like calling to light about this is someone you should pay attention to. Here's some of the obscene things he's doing statistically. And 32 innings, too. It's not like a small amount relative to all things as a reliever. And uh, I got followed by two coaches in the Guardian system within a week of those tweets, within a day of those tweets. So I'll just put that out there. I, uh, you know, I don't know if that means they're actively following him. Is, uh, you know, is that a sign that they're high on him? Potentially. But it doesn't change the fact that the stats are just stupefying. Go down to 10th. Uh, so should we just go through the list? The Miz, Kate Smith, Jack Laftwich, four Gavin Williams, five Davis Sharp, who's a recent high pick, another two-way guy, much like um, Will Brennan, Logan Allen, just you know, name a few. Aaron Pinto, another one of those kind of like under-the-radar relief arms who I believe they sent to Arizona a year ago, who's someone else they have to like consider and discuss. Jake Jewell, who's a... Scrap heap signing to give them depth. Eight is Joey Cantillo. Nine, Rodney Boone, one of the breakout draft players from a year ago. And 10, Nick Enright, who was also called up today. Strikeout rate of 11.62, walk rate of 2.51. Uh, he is up to AAA. His 2.731 FIP ties him with Will Dion, who we talked about earlier on the show and some of his crazy numbers in the minor leagues. So, again, that AAA bullpen has... Uh, Miklo Jack, who's considered the top reliever in the system. Tim Herring got the call up. Nick Enright and The Miz got called up today. Aaron Pinto is on that list of top performing relievers as well. It's quite the bullpen there. I don't know how they're going to shake out who's going to get a chance and who you could never have too many lefties. You just can't. That's just the truth of the matter. I feel very confident that if the Miz and Heron aren't protected. You're losing at least one. Uh, with what they're doing, with size and velocity and just overall production, teams need left-handed pitchers. Like it, When I was going back, and every year I'd sit there and update my list, like the Rule 5, and, and sit there and put it in categories. Like how many guys I'd taken at each listed position? Left-handed pitching. 
was a you know always at least 30 percent of the draft that the teams would just go look for that i mean tj mcfarland is a very classic guardians example of that so these are players that are performing well and that's like you just keep going through this list tanner burns tanner bibby uh 13 and 14 tim heron we were just talking about is sitting there 15th if you've been a fan of this podcast, Raymond Burgos, how long have I talked about him as one of those sleepers in the system? Is I mean, dating back to when I told you all about Cody Morris and Brian Levestita, he was my other sleeper. He's been unable to stay healthy, but he's healthy this year. And guess what? 16th in the system in FIP. 18, Trent Denholm, or 17, Trent Denholm. 18, Kevin Kelly, another one of those relief type arms. Older guy performing very well. And by older, he's what? Uh, 26. But still performance is there hunter gaddis in 19 randy labot who was i thought he was last year's draft and maybe it was a little bit longer than that if he's 25 years of age Savion curry at 21 I, I know everyone loves the list logan allen 22 by the way thomas ponticelli who just got called down 24th it's eli ligo ligo ligos 29th man i forgot that alex young was still <laughs> there in triple a but it's there is so much depth of pitching it's ridiculous and you know, I see a lot of talk about, well, what did the Guardians do at the deadline? And I'm still a firm believer that this is a team that should consider buying at the deadline uh, because of the ridiculous depth in system. I mean, I everyone is kind of a little top loader right now, but I, I have a hard time believing this team, no matter what they do, isn't going to lose multiple players in next year's Rule 5. I just I don't see a pathway to not losing multiple guys. So one way would be to do what San Diego and... Uh, Tampa have done. I mean, go back to just this past year when uh, the Guardians acquired Tobias Myers and traded away a guy in high A. Like, or you can go back before that when they acquired, uh, um, so like Huang was the pitcher and they did the same thing with Tampa. Uh, or when they got Walter Lockett from San Diego. Uh, they have a long, those organizations have a long history of getting something for a player rather than exposing them. So they could do that. Um, they could go out and make a trade. This is still a team that to me isn't well-defined. Like I am okay flipping assets for Wilson Contreras. I, I am okay flipping multiple, you know, at risk pieces for him. Is he a rental? Absolutely. But like, if that makes your team better and you're in a wild card hunt and you're getting as bad a production as they are getting out of catcher, uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, if you can trade like five pieces for Sean Murphy, go go trade five pieces for Sean Murphy if you don't have to give up any of your top five prospects. I'm fine with that. You know, he is a better version of Hedges. Not as good defensively, but very strong defensively. You know, a step down defensively, but then you get that step up offensively. Uh, but then again, at the same time, like if we talk about minor league stats, and <laughs> You know, the other side of this is if I set a minimum of 50 plate appearances, highest runs created plus in the minor leagues belongs to Bo Naylor. Uh, after his just awful, awful year, now repeating a level is always a call for concern. Remember last year's podcast when we were talking about Will Benson repeating high, low A? Or maybe this was 2019, actually. Probably 2019, actually. And, like, everyone was getting very excited by the numbers, and he got promoted to high A, and just it wasn't there. There's always a little bit of concern once a guy repeating a level. So that is where you kind of put the little, okay, we got to, you know, full check this. But Valera and Milan Tolentino, we talked about earlier, tied for second. Brennan third. Mitchell Tolman, uh, fifth in the system in uh, runs created plus. Alex Call, who, again, they convinced the White Sox to take on Yonder Alonso's full contract and got Alex Call in return. Alex Call is having himself a year down there. Again, I don't know, you know, if he gets any opportunity with this team, but like he can play all three outfield spots. Like there's value in him to other people. Joe Naranjo at seven, Angel Martinez, who's one of those, you know, top young middle infielders, shortstops in the lower minors, eight. Uh, Will Bartlett, nine. Will Benson, 10. And Trenton Brooks had a really strong year a year ago. He's sitting there at 11. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah Green, who is a central piece of the Lindor trade at 13. Jake Fox, 14. Richie Palacios in the big leagues, 15. I loved Raynel Delgado. He has had a kind of a rough, I believe he's going to be Rule 5 eligible this year. He hasn't quite lived up to the big money. Uh, and, I mean, I gave him like a second, third round grade in his draft class. 
Uh, Johnsky Noel is sitting there at 17. Micah Pyers, who's totally like a forgotten guy at 18. 19, David Fry, the catcher they got for uh, J.C. Mejia. 20 was Oscar Gonzalez. Like, there's some talent in this minor league system right now. So it's like, do you really go trade for Murphy when Naylor and Lavastina might actually be the answer? Do you go out and try to add, you know, a Brian Reynolds? And again, can you do that, like... I'm kind of at a point now where I'm like, if I can compile three guys into a useful guy, I'm all for that. I don't know if I want to trade any high-end pieces. Uh, There's still needs. There's still stuff to be had. But going back to the original point, why trade for a reliever when relievers are expensive, they're volatile, and you have four to five interesting options in AAA right now? So I'm just going to go ahead and put that out there. If they were to go get something, I, Wilson Contreras more and more feels like the get to me because you're hoping that Naylor can perform, uh, maybe be that catcher of the future in a year. The, your long-term combo of La Vestida and Naylor could be uh, back there at, at, at catcher. Maybe you can package a few things together because, again, Carter Hawkins is in charge. He knows this minor leagues as well as anyone. So I'm sure there's some guys that he liked further down the line uh, you could make a deal work. The The Guardians have an advantageous position. And I'm also fine with trading for Ian Happ because, again, it's only a two-year deal. He is on an almost all-star level right now. So if you go out and you get Happ, I know people would be like, you know, well, who's who's getting benched in that situation? And, you know, that's fair. But he also sets you up for like the... Now, the one downside is there isn't draft pick compensation anymore. So in my mind, I was like, well, then the way he's finally starting to play, living up to his talent and potential, uh, you know, he would be, you know, a player you could get maybe a draft pick for and he left, but he's not going anywhere. He's got a 134 runs created plus right now. Uh, 14.3% walk rate, highest of his career. Strikeout rate at 19%, lowest of his career. 1.9 war already, like... If you're going to go out and get someone, uh, he knows the hitting coach. He is. These are two players that are on a near all-star level. He's a switch hitter. I'm still all for this trade. I'm still all for adding Hap and adding um, Contreras. If you have, you know, Hap in left field, Straw in center field, and then right field, Oscar Gonzalez keeps hitting, that's great. Stephen Kwan keeps hitting. That's great. Or, or, you know what you can do for those young players? Platoon them. Now, I know I had my anti-platoon rant earlier this week already, but in this case, you platoon those two young players to protect them. You also then have, you know, with Kwan, can kind of replace that Mercado role as a plus version. We're going to sit here and play Mercado as much as we are. We might as well get an outfielder who can play every day. Uh, the one thing in the past, the splits I feel like have not been the best for um uh for Ian Happ if I just go and look at the advanced numbers uh no he's quite solid this year uh so yeah I, I'm still all for this let those you know essentially replace Mercado with Quan. let Quan and Gonzalez and if Gonzalez implodes and comes back to earth well Quan can play right field every day Contreras the catcher you know, the mailman has slowed up in his delivery. I'm totally fine shipping him back to be the backup in Chicago and having Hedges be a backup for this year with Contreras. And then occasionally he could DH. And you can make it work for this team. And you can have Naylor at first base, Miller at, at second base, shortstop, Jimenez, third base, Jose, DH, Fran Mill. Or you could do some platoon with Rosario on the infield, um, platooning with somebody uh, in terms of stuff. It's, you know, he he's definitely has some platoon splits himself. I think it still makes this team better. And I still think a trade like that makes the most sense because the Cubs front office knows the Guardians front office, knows the Guardians prospects better than anyone, and they would probably prefer guys they know to guys they don't know as well. I'm going long. We're already at the 29-minute mark. Let's take a break, come back, and talk about the Rockies. We talked about them at the top of the show. Blue Mile, Blue Mile, no, Blue Nile is the show's title sponsor today. And, you know, this is a wet place that makes interesting looking uh, non cookie cutter jewelry. You know, they do a lot of wedding, but they also do everyday fine jewelry. Uh, whatever it is you are looking for, 
you are going to find that over at BlueNile.com. You know, create the engagement ring of their dreams. Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting and style. Blue Nile's bench jewelers will then handcraft the perfect engagement ring. Each ring is one of a kind. You know, or they have 24-7 experts available via phone or chat to help you get a memorable gift on a budget. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners. Get $50 off of purchases of 500 or more. This podcast includes engagements. Use code locked on. That's code locked on. Plus every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging. Don't give away what's inside. Shop stress free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. Let's end with this Rockies preview. Uh, so overall, Colorado is currently last in their division uh, at 27 and 34. They're at a 443 winning percentage, 10 and a half games back. Cleveland is now currently sitting uh, three games back of the Twins, and I didn't check the wild card uh, rankings before the show today. So let's just get down to it. Let's compare and contrast these teams. Let's start at catcher. So we've talked about Austin Hedges a lot. Uh, over, uh, they have Eli Elias Diaz has been their primary catcher, but he's also split time with Brian Severin, when you're getting down to it in this situation, in terms of the production of this team, uh, Elias Diaz is a 42, runs created plus. Severin is at a 97, but that's in uh, 15 games. So it's mostly been Elias Diaz, who's a backup, who doesn't have good defensive <laughs> numbers, who's been forced into starting detail. Um, advantage Cleveland, one of the few times this year we get to say that, starting a, at the catcher position, but that is... Evange Cleveland. First base, C.J. Cron has been their primary first base uh, for the past few weeks. For Cleveland, that is a position that you got three games with Josh Naylor at first, and you got two with Owen Miller. We're going to call it Naylor's position. Naylor is starting to come back to earth. That's something we should probably get into on the show. He's down to 128 runs, created plus. Uh, You know, he's... Man. Jose Ramirez is already worth three and a half wins. Andres Jimenez, with his limited plays, at 2.1 wins. Like, his war, if he played every day, would be near Jose's. Just going to state that now. Uh, but over for Colorado, with Cron, he's got a 128 runs created plus. He's been really productive for them. He's at a 1.2 war. Uh, Neil Arizona mentions at a .7. Neither are good defenders. Uh, slash line... 291, 344, 532. It's advantage San Diego, but it's... Or San Diego. Nope. Colorado, but it's almost a push. Uh, moving to second base. Cleveland's primary second baseman has been Andres Jimenez. Uh, unfortunately, in that statement, is painful for me to say. Primary second baseman, Brendan Rodgers, who I uh, had as the number one player in his draft class back in uh, 2015. <sighs> yes. Yes, I, I, you know, I'll stand by what I said. It hasn't worked out necessarily, but he's, I think he could still handle short, and he's got an 89 runs created plus. It's it's not ideal, uh, needless to say. That is advantage. Cleveland moving to shortstop, <laughs> Ahmed Rosario versus uh, Jose Iglesias. Man, Jose Iglesias just sticks around forever. Uh, on the air, though, 97 runs created plus. Always a solid defender. Not quite the plus star defender he once was. You over to what I know Jimenez has played, or Jimenez, Rosario has played better of late. He's got a, he's actually got a higher defensive grading than Iglesias on fan graphs. Uh, not the best way to judge defense, if we're being honest. But he's been a worse bat. It's advantage Colorado right now. Uh, better hitter, and I still think he's a better defender. So we're still tied, moving to third base, advantage Cleveland. Uh, Ryan McManon is having a fine year. Uh, actually, a down year, sorry. Uh 88 runs created plus, 0.17 war. He's got about as much war as Josh Naylor. Uh, some of that coming from his defensive value. He had a fine year a year ago. A little bit down right now for them. Uh, they're also missing Chris Bryant, who is currently hurt. Uh, was their big free agent signing uh, from this class. He has a strained lower back. They're also without uh, Ryan Rollison. He made it to the big leagues yet for them. I missed that. Former first-round pick. Uh, Hector Olveres, Ty Black, 
uh, Tyler McKinley and Scott Odeberg, or Oberg, who had been one of their top relievers. Uh, so, yeah, they're without, uh, you know, a big part of their lineup without having uh, access to Chris Bryant. But third base, even if Bryant was there and healthy, it would be advantage Cleveland. So that gives Cleveland uh, one spot. Comparing DH right now, before I move to the outfield, Charlie Blackman has been the primary DH for Colorado, having four games there in the past week. He's got 95 runs created plus. He's been with Worth barely over one war. Cleveland's primary DH over the last week. This is the problem. It's shifted so much that if we're listing Naylor as the first baseman, then I probably have to call it Owen Miller, and then that becomes advantage. Guardians for a two-point advantage. Moving to outfield. Center field for Cleveland, Miles Straw. Yes, offensively, that has been a disaster of late, but defensively, he's fantastic. Colorado has mostly played Yonatan Diaz, who has had a 105 runs created plus. Defensive rating, uh, again, the fan graphs one isn't the best one to necessarily look at. It's only 48 games, 158 played. 48 games is a solid amount. Uh, right now, that's advantage to Colorado. So that gives a one-point advantage moving to the corner spots. Starting in right field, that has been Oscar Gonzalez's home. And on the other side, I just need to put these next to each other so it's better to reference. Randall Gearchuk had two games for them. And this is one that's been kind of all over the place. A lot of different guys have played it. Uh, we're going to go with Randall Gearchuk uh, for that position for them. And over the course of this year, having been acquired from Toronto in what was kind of a money-saving move, he's got a 75 runs created plus and a bad defensive rating. That's advantage Cleveland right now. That gives him a two-point lead. Connor Joe is the primary left fielder. He's got a 100 uh, runs created plus. He's been about league average. 308 average. Or, I'm sorry, that's his bat. 256, 352, 388. Not much power for him. Cleveland's primary left fielder has been Stephen Kwan over the past few, uh, over the past week. And his numbers are better. <laughs> it's weird to say this. They won on the Guardians with a three point win because they won on the corner outfields and catcher. Haven't had a chance to say that much this year. Uh, pitching wise, uh, for Colorado. Kyle Freeland has been their ace for the past few years. Uh, Cleveland's going to face in this series of games uh, Antonio Sensalata, Austin Gober, and Chad Kuhl. Uh, Chad Kuhl's been worth .8. He's got a FIP of 432. Sensalata is the same war, but his FIP is 384. It's been a little better. And Gomber is worth .6 with a FIP of 4.41. They've been kind of back-end types for uh, Colorado. Uh, German Marquez has struggled. He was, you know, up there in terms of name value. When you're looking just matchup to matchup, Sansaletta versus Bieber should be advantage. Cleveland, Gomber versus Pilkington. Pilkington's been up and down. Uh, you might call that kind of a push. And McKenzie versus Kugel should be advantage Cleveland. Uh, Tuesday and Thursday should be near lock games for them. Wednesday is the one that you have a little less, you know, faith, but it's still a game that is very winnable. This is a series they should sweep. Uh, we didn't talk about the bullpen. Daniel Bard is a great story coming back after being like out of baseball, being as effective as he has been. Alex Colome you know, has bounced around, but been a pretty consistent reliever. And the rest of that bullpen, I mean, Jules Chassen is in their bullpen right now. The, the king of moving around. Ryan Feltner, former Ohio State and Walsh High School player. So that's something fun to watch. Lucas Gilberth. Gilbreth, I feel like I saw him face Ryan Feltner when Gilbreth was uh, at Minnesota and was the top pitcher in the conference in the Big Ten that year. Robert Stevenson, who, uh, you know, was the perfect Reds pitcher at their peak, where it's like everyone knew this guy misses bats, he has control issues, and then goes through the entire minor league system, and they never do any improvement or changes to him. Good on him making it to the big leagues, but it was just like, where, what are you doing, Reds? Why is there no attempt to like make players be more than what they were when you drafted them? Uh, again, this should be an easy two out of three with a good chance for three out of three. Guardians in the wild cards hunt. They need to go ahead and beat these bad teams. We're getting dangerous. We're going to be over 40 minutes. Let's wrap it up. 
uh, this nearly 3 a.m. edition, my time, so 4 a.m. your time, edition of Lockdown Guardians. I've been Jeff Ellis. Uh, remember, rate and review, download daily. It helps. Subscribe on the YouTube. That is also extremely helpful. And as I end every episode now, go, go, Guardians, go.